my spiritual heritage comes from a prophetic line. And so any, any time you hit an atmosphere that's already prophetic, it just ignites the gift of God that's in you. So y'all don't blame this on me. Y'all blame it on her. Okay. Because don't, don't let nobody, whoever come to your church and share their word, make you think they're that anointed. And they ride up the anointedness of the house. And so, you ought to thank God that your head is anointed. Why, why do we thank God that the head is anointed? Because according to Psalms, he anoints my head with oil. Then my cup runs over. And so your cup runs over because your head's anointed. Could you do me a favor? Tell, just tell your neighbor, I thank God my head's anointed. Yeah, because there, there are some churches that I've been, I've been, uh, I've been preaching the gospel since I was 16, but I've been in church all my life. And I've discovered there are some churches God don't go to no more. Just because just it say the name church on the outside don't mean they got God on the inside. And so I appreciate God that we can go somewhere that has not just got his name on the outside, but we have his presence on the inside. I want to tonight, just, just for a few moments, just give me a few moments. I want to uh, uh, share with you out of, out of the word uh, uh, of the Lord. Now, I done got a little older. I'm hitting 50 in a couple of months. And so uh, those who know me from back in the day, I done got a little older. So all, all that land on the floor and jumping pews, I ain't quite there no more. I done got a little older. And so I'm just going to share with you. <laughs> I ain't studying you, Jamal. I'm, I'm just going to share with you out of the word of, of, of the Lord. But I want to, uh, this evening, I want to talk to you from the subject, who is going to minister to the minister? Do me a favor, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, who is going to minister to the minister? So I want to talk about who is going to minister to, to the ministers. We sit here this evening in this uh, pastoral celebration. I, I have personally been pastoring about 19 years, and the truth of the matter is, uh, in the lives of most pastors, the pastoral anniversary celebration is one of the most depressing times of the year. Because you, you have to deal with the fact that it's at this time folks show how they really feel. Y'all should have shouted earlier. I gave you a chance. It is at this time you really see the hearts of people. Folk who you have been there for all year long. We set aside a few days to celebrate leadership. And they were saying, folk whose son you prayed out of prison won't take 24 hours to celebrate you. And, and because it becomes so depressing, honestly, uh, statistically, uh, most pastors leave ministry there are more pastors leaving ministry in this hour than any other profession and, and, and I suggest you again been doing this for, for, for 19 years if you gonna do this you better know God has graced you to do it cause, 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 cause leading us folk ain't easy and so, uh, that's what brought the question up to me that when we have ministered to everybody else, who is going to minister to us? And, and the problem has become in, in the church 
that we have relegated ministering to the minister to a select group. And we do not understand that all of us are tasked with the assignment of ministering to the minister. You know, we, we, we honestly think, oh, that's the armor bearer's job. But the truth of the matter is, we all are armor bearers. You know, I, I, at my church, I, I tell those who, quote unquote, serve as, as armor bearers, if all you good for is to carry me some water, you ain't no good no way. Because when I'm home, ain't nobody bringing me no water. But, but I need individuals who can pick me up in the spirit. That when I'm at the point of throwing in the towel and saying, forget about this. They are able to go to God on my behalf and help me make it through tough places. And, and, but there are qualifications. See, see, the church is the only place. I'm, I'm going to hurry. The p- church is the only place to, where we don't feel like we need to qualify to do nothing. You know, your job won't give you your promotion without qualifications. But we believe in you because we think you're anointed. But your job say prove you got it. So let's go to Exodus, Exodus, let, let, let me hear it. Go to Exodus, Exodus chapter number 17 real quick. Exodus 17, I'm going to talk to y'all at night. Again, you should have shouted earlier. <laughs> Exodus chapter number 17, and let's start looking uh, at verse number uh, 19. Exodus 17. And start at verse number 9, excuse me, start at verse number 9. Exodus 17. Start at verse number nine. Someone's reading for me. Thank you. And Moses said unto Joshua, Uh choose us out men and go out, fight with Amalek. Uh Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. Okay, so so Moses has assigned Joshua. Now I know, uh, just just help y'all real quick. I know in in church, again, we got this theology that 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 uh, 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 you just go directly to God and you hear from God for yourself. And when you study the life of a Moses and Joshua, God never uh, announces his relationship to Joshua. As as a matter of fact. Throughout the scripture, every time God deals with Joshua, he would say, Joshua, Moses minister. Joshua was not the minister of God. He was Moses minister. He did not minister to God. He ministered to Moses. Problem, problem with us in this hour, we want to bypass leadership. Because you got a relationship with God. And, and a further truth, the only reason you're able to hear God is because you hear Moses. Uh, uh, because, because as quiet as it is kept, when God really talks to you, he sounds like your leader. Uh, prove it to me with scripture come here uh, Samuel what's your testimony uh, preacher I was raised in the temple and according to the story of Samuel I did not yet know the Lord he had to be revealed unto me and when God started ministering or speaking to me instead of me asking God what he said I ran to Eli and I said Eli you did call me and Eli said to me boy go lie down uh, uh, read it when y'all get time he said he says go lie down in your place see some of us the problem is you ain't in your place you 
You trying to be in somebody's face instead of being in your face. He, he, he gets up again and he goes back to Eli and he says, son, I did not call you. Go back and lie down in your place. He, he gets up a third time. The text says then Eli perceives that it is God. And this time when it comes, he said, oh, the Lord is talking to you. The reason why he kept going to Eli is because God sounded like his leader. Okay. See, see, all y'all that you hear in God, if God don't sound like Tangela Brian Brooker, it ain't God, it's the enemy. Could you do me a favor? Ask your neighbor, say, neighbor, the last time you heard God, did it sound like the leader? So, so, so. Moses assigns Joshua and says, Joshua, choose out some men to go down and fight. Read the text, please. Mm -hmm. So Joshua did as Moses had said to uh -huh. him and fought with Amalek. Uh -huh. And Moses, Aaron, and Ur went up to the top okay, of the hill. Okay, so, so, so the text says Moses, Aaron, and Ur went up to the top of of the hill. This is just a side side note. Don't get mad because leadership has to have an inner circle. See, 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 everybody can't be a part of the inner circle because everybody can't handle secrets. See, real leadership got to know about you but still love you. Uh -huh. real, real leadership know the deep dirty on you but still cover you <laughs> see real leadership knew you were in the hotel getting motel last night but we ain't told nobody so so they go down to fight but but Moses Aaron and Ur they they go up read the text I got to hurry uh -huh. read read from it. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hands uh -huh. that Israel prevailed. Oh, come, come and here, Jamal. Long, long as, long as, long as Moses held up his hand. Yes. The people. Yes. He wasn't holding up his hands for him. He was holding up his hand so the people could have victory. Oh God. And then she ain't stand here because she needs some income. She stands so, so that the people can continue to have victory. But 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 you got to understand that in leadership, in our humanism, there are times we get tired. Uh-huh. Oh, do me a favor. Tell your neighbor that sometimes I get tired too. Uh-huh. So, 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 so how is it you can get tired, but leaders can't get tired? How is it you could want to tell folk off? But y'all won't look special if you want to tell somebody off. So, so Moses is being, he's have his hands being supported. Uh -huh. Come, come here, uh, so boy. Come here, Jamal. Uh, uh, so, so he got his arms supported by Aaron and and Ur. Their assignment is to hold up the arms of the leader, so the people can continue to have victory. He becomes the problem when you only have two individuals in the whole circle who can hold up the arms of the leader just like the leader get tired them that's holding up his arm get tired too so so the proper structure if we go hold up and minister to the leader because when you minister to the leader to be an armor bearer means to carry the responsibility okay okay so so i'm gonna come on i'm gonna use you you get behind him uh-huh 
you stand behind him. Uh, come, Mike, stand, stand behind him. Because the proper structure is supposed to be so that the leader's arm can stand up. That the moment those who are holding up the leader's arm get tired, he can go get a break. Go get back in line. See, so what happens is the leader's arm never go down because there's always somebody in place to hold the leader's arm. I wish I had the right set of folk that can catch the revelation that you got to be in position and posture. Even, even when I was a little boy, we used to watch wrestling. Uh-huh. And look like just about the time it looked like they were going to lose. Somebody would say, tag. You win. What it looked like, I'm about to get tired of holding up the arms of the leader. I need to have somebody I can tag. Do me a favor, touch your neighbor and say, tag, you in. Thank you, gentlemen. And that way, you, the leader never gets tired, so we never lose victory. See, the reason why, reason why the church at large is experiencing seasonal victories is because we keep letting the leader arms. Because we need others who are able to support and hold the arms of the leader. Okay, let, let me let me hurry. God let y'all folk go go home. So, so read, read the text, sweetheart. Let me let me hear it. Uh -huh. And when he let down his hands, Amalek prevailed. So, so, so the moment the leader's arms come down, the enemy gets the upper hand. See, see, that's why you must be in constant warfare for your leader. Okay, I want you to understand something that. How the enemy strategically works, the storm that hits your life as a believer is nothing compared to the storm that hits your leader life. Okay, okay. Some, some years ago uh, in Miami, uh, we had, we've had several uh, real bad storms. One storm we had some years ago was called Hurricane Andrew. Hurricane Andrew impacted Miami and there are folk who 20 years later have still never recovered. Now, now I live in Miami, but I live in what you call Miami Gardens. I live on the north end of Miami. So when the storm hit, we got the outer bands. So when I got up the next morning, I had a couple of shingles missing off my roof and the power was out for a couple of days. So, so I'm not saying I didn't have issues, but the eye of the storm hit South Miami. Oh, that's where they suffered real damage. Y'all going to get it in a moment. See what you're going through. You just dealing with the eye of the bands. You ain't dealt with the eye of the storm because the eye of the storm is leadership. So what you're going through is nothing compared to what a leader or those who are in leadership really go through because you only getting the outer bands of the warfare. Okay, read, read the text. Let me, let me hear it. Uh -huh. But Moses' hands were heavy and they took a stone and put it under him and he sat thereon. Uh -huh. And Aaron and Ur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side. Uh -huh. And his hands were steady until the going down Hold of up. the sun. His hands were steady. Okay, okay. Uh, problem becomes why we can't have steady ministry is because we got unsteady people. The ministry is only as steady as the people. So when we got flaky people, we got flaky ministry. When we have un discontented people, we have discontented ministry. But when we have stable people, 
Okay, what 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 a stable people. Recall uh, years ago, my former pastor was going to be on with the Lord. Uh, one thing, a principle she taught us as leaders was, you've got to know how to go through gracefully. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. In other words, as a leader, you ought to be able to go through and don't nobody know you going through. See, there are some of you we could tell when you going through. Because uh -huh. you wear go through on your face. You got go through in your spirit. You got go through in your testimony. As a matter of fact, when you start going through, you boycott God with your praise. You won't sing. You won't dance. You won't shout. You won't hallelujah. Why? Because you going through. But when you understand that I got to be steady, be steadfast unmovable always abounding in the word of the Lord knowing that your labor mm -hmm. see when you when you when you go through gracefully don't nobody even know they, they don't know you going home to the dark because you ain't got no lights because because you shouted like everything going well Okay, let me help you. Here, here's how you could tell uh, a real leader uh, who supports ministry and who is stable is because you don't just shout when things going well. Okay, scripture, scripture says this about us. The scripture says we are more than conquerors. Okay, we got to ask a question. What makes a person more than a conqueror? A conqueror is one who shouts when they get victory. A conqueror is one who shouts because they got money in their pocket. A conqueror is one that dances because their relationship has gone well. But more than a conqueror is an individual. You ain't got no money in the bank, but you still shouting. Your husband messing up, but you're still dancing. Your children acting like chucky, but you're still dancing. Why? Because I'm more than See, the devil ain't afraid of conquerors. He's afraid of more than conquerors. Okay, hurry. Because we see conquerors, when conquerors get there, then they win. But when you're more than a conqueror, when they hear you come and they leave. Okay. I'm sure, okay. I gotta go to the next step. I'm gonna show it to you. The Bible says, the Bible, the Bible says that 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 Jericho. <laughs> The walled city of Jericho was straightly shut up. It was shut up because they heard Israel was coming with their God. And so the walls were straightly shut up. Oh God. It was not only to keep Israel out, but it was to keep them safe in. But see, when you're more than a conqueror, your name precedes you. The devil already knows you got victory. He knows you're going to give God glory because you're more than. So, so, so he, uh, Moses gets, he gets tired. He gets tired. What, what verse you on? Uh, 13. Oh, okay. Uh, let, let's go real quick. First Samuel. Let me hear it. First, first Samuel 16. So, so, so if we're going to do this and hold up the hand of the leader, there are some qualifications that you must have. First Samuel 16. And, and let's look, let's start uh, at verse 17, 1 Samuel 16. I'm almost going to let y'all go home. 1 Samuel uh, uh, 16. And let's look starting at verse number 17. Uh-huh. And Saul said unto his servants, provide me now a man that can play oh, well. Stop, stop, stop. Paul says, Saul says, Saul, 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 who is now king, says, provide me a man who can play he says to them provide me an individual 
someone who can play. But notice the text. He says, that can play well. If you gonna help and minister to the minister, you must be able to do what you do well. All is half stepping in the kingdom. See, told y'all before, the church is the only place where you ain't got to qualify for nothing. But in this next season, baby, you gonna have to qualify to do whatever you do in the kingdom. No, you want us to qualify. That we want to see that you know how to hold your hand. Could you do me a favor? Ask your neighbor, are you qualified? <laughs> Every individual that does anything in the kingdom got to be qualified. Anybody that grabs the mic ought to be qualified. See, see, well, let's just know you qualify is that when you get up and do what you do, if we close our eyes, we think it's her. I know y'all deep. I got my own sound. That's the problem. Because you got your own sound, you got a conflicting sound. Because your sound is supposed to be harmonious. It's supposed to flow in harmony with the house. If your sound is a conflicting sound, it's a noise. And so he says, provide me someone who is skillful or well at playing. In other words, you must be well versed and skillful in serving in your assignment. You, 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 you got to make sure. Okay, if you're going to be, if you're going to be skillful, here's the problem with, with, with church folk is that we don't practice our craft. Mm-hmm. We we don't we don't practice our craft. We we just show up and think we could do it. Uh, we you know the, I, I recall growing up. Well, uh, usher boy would have usher board meeting because we wanted to make sure that you knew how to hold your hand. Y'all, excuse me. I grew up Baptist. We wanted to make sure you know how to hold up your hand and tell us two seats in the front. And so we met, and we met twice a month just to practice. Okay, okay. Here's, here's, here's why we met. Because, because one Sunday, uh, I may be assigned the back door. But the next Sunday, I may be assigned the front. Okay. See, here's, here's the problem with church folk. Church folk ain't versatile. Y'all only know how to handle one spot. But you need to be able to handle any spot that we put you in. That if I tell you this morning, I want you to serve here. But tomorrow, I want you to serve over there. And you say, no problem, Pastor. I got it covered. Why? Because I'm versatile. I'm well skilled at what I do. Whether I see lead or background, I can do it. So, 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 uh, yes, somebody who's skilled. Because we ain't got time for novice. Why? Because souls are at stake. We ain't got time for you to be playing and figuring out. <sighs> okay, okay, so so he says, give me somebody. Uh, uh, notice he says somebody who is who plays well. But, but hear what he says. He did not say, give me somebody who's anointed. Mm. Mm. 
Because some of you got oil, but you ain't got skills. Child, but I'm anointed, but you don't know what you're doing. Revelations without implementation, you still a fool. So no matter how anointed you are, if you don't know how to flow in that, you still of none effect. So it's not enough just for you to be anointed. You got to be skillful and anointed. Okay, okay, hurry, read, read the text. Let me let these folks go home. Uh-huh, read, uh-huh. And bring him to me. Mm-hmm. Then- oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I didn't see that part, but, but he says, he says, when you find this individual, don't just put him in position. Bring that Negro. I know he was wonderful at the other church. But before he can operate in this, bring him to me because I need to validate. God help me here. All y'all that don't want to be validated, don't want nobody to make an affirmation of the grace of God that's on your life. You need somebody to affirm what God has called you to do. You, you just can't hop up and go get you a candy store and call it church. You got to be affirmed. And that affirmation comes from you, me checking you out. You see, there's some stuff about you your friends don't know. <sighs> read, read, read the text. I'm going to go. Then answered one of the servants and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Uh Bethlehemite, Uh that is cunning and playing and a mighty, valiant man. So so, so first of all, the text says he is cunning. He's he's skilled in playing. But next of all, the text says he's a valiant man. The word valiant means he's a person of courage. Mm -hmm. Courage is is the ability to handle opposition and adverse circumstances. Courage is the ability to deal with difficult situations. Courage is the ability to have stick ability. I know somebody said, preacher, stick ability ain't a word. I just made it one. In the English language, it's called morphology. It's when you make up your own words. And so stickability means to have the ability to stick. Not stick only in good times, but stick in bad times. Okay, okay. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is in the presence of fear. I keep going forward. (sighs) See, 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 what happens to us a lot of folk who's supposed to be in leadership, you find till you start going through. You faithful till it hits your house. You got a word for everybody else till it's your time. But when you are a valiant individual, you have courage under fire. That all hell is hitting your house. But you made up in your mind, I will let nothing separate me from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. Come hell or high water. So, so David says, David says, he says, he says, listen, Saul, Saul, we got a young man. He is cunning. He's skillful. But not only he's skillful, this boy ain't scared. See, see, in this next season, God's about to send in some no-limit soldiers. He 
about to send in some Negroes that's saying, I ain't never scared. See, some of y'all, see, here come the problem. Some of y'all got saved and sanctified and you lost your fight. Listen, the Holy Ghost didn't take the hood out of me. Y'all don't want to, see, that's wrong with church folk. Church folk don't want to be real. I'll slap you down and pray you heal. We need individuals in this hour that says, Pastor, I got you in the word, but if you need a Negro to fight. Could you do me a favor? Tell your neighbor, I ain't never scared. The text says that David is valid. See, see, because, because understand, we're not going to be able to build unless we have, again, people who are versatile. Your versatility is not only being able to serve in every position, but in the book of Nehemiah, when they were building the wall, the Bible says, <laughs> I love the Bible. The Bible says they had working tools in one hand, but they had a sword in the other. If y'all want to help us build, we'll build. But if y'all want to fight, See, I, I can't speak for y'all. And I know some of y'all ain't going to be able to handle this. But, but, but Mike's, I, as a matter of fact, I sleep at night with my fist ball in, in case a nigga starts up. <laughs> read, read the Texas. And a man of war. And not only must he not be scared, he must be able to go to war. At a moment's notice, he must be able to put his shop to the side and say, I'm ready to go to war. See, see, what we've lost in this hour, we've lost warring saints. I ain't talking about just warring in the natural. I'm talking about learning how to war in the spirit. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principality, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We've got to learn how to pull down strongholds in every high thing that exalts itself against the very knowledge. You have to be so in tune with your leadership that before the enemy even attacks her, you already done cut him off at the path. Because you have been taught how to war. The problem ain't you being taught how to war, the problem is you won't go to war. <laughs> but, but, but even in the United States, uh, there, there's a certain age where you have no choice but to enlist. And, and if you choose not to, they'll just draft you in. We've got to get to the place where we start warring in the spirit for the household of faith. That we start warring in the spirit for our leadership. Because if we war, we will beat back the hand of the enemy. Let me, let me hurry. Okay, read, read, read the text. Let me, let me hurry. Let me hurry. Uh, and prudent in matters. So, so, so he must be a man of war. Uh, in order to be a man of war, you must know your enemies. Mary, you, you got to know your enemy. You got to know your weapons 
but you got to know your allies. Okay, okay. See, see, he says, I will not leave you ignorant of the devil's devices. So, you, yeah, yeah, I know y'all, y'all, ooh, child, I know God, but do you know the devil? Because your problem ain't with God. Okay, okay. When, when I was in high school, when I was in high school, I played football when I lived in Waycross, Georgia. And what we would do weeks before the game, although all week at the school, we went and trained on the field. But then there was a day the coach would say, today we ain't going to the field. We're going to watch a film. We're going to watch a film. It's going to be movie night. And he said, no, 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 no. I need you to know who your opponent is. I need you to take time to study your enemy so that you'll know how he moves, that you'll know how he comes, so you'll know what he's trying to do. So when he moves, you'll move. Oh, God, help me. And see, that some of us, your problem is you don't know the schemes of the devil. And that's why he keeps beating you down. Because you ain't studying his tactics. You ain't studying. See, see let, me, let, me, let me help you. The devil knows what makes you tick. The devil knows what turns you on. You know, I, that's why some of you, certain guys, the devil ain't sending your way. Because he know your head ain't going to turn. But he's going to send the one that's the height you want. The skin color you want. Everything else you want. And that's how you keep getting fooled. Okay, they're not going to like this next part. Because the devil going to send you what you want. But God gonna send you what you need. <laughs> and what you need might look like a monkey, but even a monkey look good in a suit. Let me go to the text. He, she read the scripture, she says, he is prudent in mass. The term prudent means he's wise. If, if you're going to hold up the hands of the leader, you got to learn how to use wisdom. Problem with some of us in church, you don't know when to shut up. I'm going to turn and talk to the wall. When I was a little boy, there was a song that said, you talk too much, you worry me to death. You talk so much, you even worry yourself. You talk about people you don't even know. You talk about places you ain't ever going to go. You just simply talk too much. And that becomes a problem that when you are in leadership, if you go hold up the arms of the leader, you got to learn how to do wisdom. You got to learn when to talk and when to just... Everything that's revealed to you is not to be shared with everybody. Because when you hold up the arms of the leader, sometimes you're going to be in a position where you're going to hear sensitive batters. And we got to know that we can trust you with sensitive matters. See, trust is not built on what you do in my presence. Trust is built on what you do in my absence. Cause a whole lot of folk know how to act when you're around. But the real test is when I'm nowhere around. And what you heard, what I said, you ain't never shared with nobody. Real, real, real armor bearers are leaders who support the arm of the leader. The leader should be able to get naked and not be ashamed. 
look how, look how, look how y'all looking. Come here. Come here. I'm going back to the text. Come here. Come here. Moses. Well, uh, come here. Come here. Noah, what's your testimony? You know what? After I got through doing what God called me to do, I needed to get high. Because dealing with these church folk, I needed a drink. Look how y'all, some of y'all gonna play deep. Some of y'all drink anyway, so don't play deep on me. Don't, don't play, I'll point you out. <laughs> it's under the sink right now in the corner. You trying to hide it from the kids, they know. Noah, the Bible says he got drunk, but he got drunk in his tent. There, there's some stuff I do in private, ain't your business. <laughs> look how y'all looking. He was in his own tent. And the text says his son goes in and sees his father's nakedness. The problem was not seeing his father's nakedness. The problem was he didn't know how to keep it to himself. Could, could you do me a favor? Ask your neighbor, say, neighbor, can you cover me till I get up? He, the Bible says he comes outside the tent <laughs> and he tells it to his brothers but his brothers have enough integrity to say I don't want to see daddy naked I don't want to see daddy naked because I don't want to change my view of daddy so what I'm going to do I'm going to go in backwards because what I don't know can't hurt me and the text says they covered his nakedness <laughs> well check out the rest of the text because the text says when Noah got up he knew just because I'm in a drunken state don't mean I'm in an unaware state. <laughs> yeah. He knew what his son had done to him. Now, when you read this original text, it's not really his son, it's his grandson. Because it is his grandson, Cana, who did it, who is Ham's son. And, and see... He is so powerful as the man of God that the text says he pronounces a curse on Cana, not Ham. And the real curse ain't the curse of color. Because <laughs> this can't be a curse. Because <laughs> this stand up in the sun and everything. <laughs> and it don't crack. But the curse, I got to hear my text. The curse was, he says to him, a servant of service shall you always be. He says to him, here's going to be the curse. You're going to serve everybody else except your daddy. So the real curse is when you can serve everybody else's house, but you can never serve your daddy's house. Okay, let, let, let me hurry. So, 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 he, 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 he is a man who is prudent. He is wise. He understands or has wisdom enough to know even, oh, they're not going to like this God, even when Saul does me wrong, I still got to submit to Saul. See, hold on y'all. You only want to submit when you agree with what we say. 
Real submission is when you do what I say even when you don't agree. Real submission is the word submission means authority under control. I know I could do what I want to do, but I still do what you said do. Mm. So, so he, he, he understands he is prudent. He's wise enough to know I still got to serve. Say, I recall, and I got to hurry. Uh, uh, again, and I know this, this is a different generation. So the stuff I went through and ministered, most of y'all couldn't handle that. Because, see, I had a former pastor. My pastor was going to be the Lord who would, who would tell me, you anointed, but sit down with your anointed itself. See, we, when, we, when we got sat down in church, we cried. Y'all get sat down and tell me, child, I got a break. Y'all be happy to get sat down. Y'all, y'all do stuff so we can sit you down. But the true sign of a son is when you can endure chastisement. If you cannot endure chastisement, I know y'all ain't gonna like this. You a bastard and not a son. Could you do me one favor? Ask your neighbor, have you passed the bastard test? Read, read the text. Let me let these folks go home. Uh-huh, read, read. And a calmly person. Okay, so not only is he prudent or wise, the text says David is comely. Comely means David not only acts the part, he looks the part. You, you, you can't work in leadership and look like something to cat drug in. No, no. No, I know. I... I know, I know we embracing all kinds. But some of this stuff y'all wearing. I don't care what they say across town. Holiness is still right. Comely, you must understand, you are a representation of your leader. Ain't no way your leader could look like that and you look like. I mean, can I, can I just be honest? There are just some things the Holy Ghost ain't got to tell you not to wear. The Holy Ghost ain't got to tell you your dress too short. Let me tell you how you gonna know. When you feel wind in the areas you ain't supposed to feel wind. You are a representative of the leadership. You are a representative of the kingdom. You need to look the part at all times. Yeah, we, see, 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 I gotta hurry. We, we have now allowed our liberty to make us fools. Don't, don't misunderstand. We ain't trying to put you in bondage. But at the same time, you can't get so loose. See, see, some of you, oh God, some, some of you younger sisters, you wondering why you getting a certain kind of dude because you look a certain type of way. And what you look like attract that kind. But if you change your look, you'll change what you attract. There, there ought to be a look about you that say, if you ain't making a certain amount, I ain't dealing with you. Let me, let me hurry. He is comely. Uh, he is comely. Not only means he's handsome and attractive, but he has an attractive disposition. 
at an attractive personality. You can't be a representation of the leader with a bad attitude. How you, how, how are you, how you gonna serve a loving leader who loves any and everybody and you got hang ups on people? You've got to learn to embrace whatever God sends through the door. I don't care if they toe up from the flow up, embrace them. Your personality has to be in check. You, you a usher. You're the first one we meet at the door. And you were to usher us into the presence of God. And, and here you come walking with Adam. Sit over here. Can, can I get a fan? We ain't got no fan. You, you mad about Jesus? There must be something attractive about your personality, your disposition that is reflective of the personality of your leader. See, see, I'm gonna help y'all. We are, we are in a season where God is about to send in all kinds. We don't have to like what they do. But we have to love the hell out of them. With loving kindness have I drawn you. See, see, the, the, the debate in the church ain't about sexuality. The debate in the church is about love. Because you can love me out of what I'm in. Lord, I wish... Most folk in the world, all they're looking for is acceptance. No, no, I ain't tell, they ain't trying to tell you accept my lifestyle. They're trying to tell you accept me. If you can accept me with all my faults, if you can accept me with all my mess up, then I know that is the pure love of God. Read, read this text. I got, I got to hurry. I got to, I just, and the Lord is with him. Okay, okay. Not only must he be comely, but the text says, but the Lord got to be with him. He needs to have the presence of God on his life. If you are going to serve at this next level, at this next dimension, the glory of God has to be on your life. Here comes the line. Problem. Y'all play something soft. Let me let these folk on. Here becomes the problem. Most folk that come to church, we want to introduce them to the leader. But what you ought to do, you should have got them delivered yourself. I don't need you to introduce me, them to me. I need you to introduce them to Jesus. See, the reason why you trying to introduce them to leadership because ain't no glory on you. See, I, I, I got saved old school. And when I got saved, the usher cast the demon out you. Pastor could be up preaching to us to come out in Jesus' name. Loose the man and let him go. Pastor never knew we were getting delivered in the back. Because there was a glory that rested on the life of every individual in the house. If we are going to make, make her job easier, there's a glory got to be on us. There's a glory that must be on your life. There's a glory. There ought to be something about you that when somebody come in contact with you, they say, I know you've been with the Lord. 
Show it to us in scripture. The Bible says Moses goes up to the mountain. Moses goes up, doesn't see God because no man can look on God and live. God says, here's what I'm going to do, Moses. I'm going to hide you in the cleft of the rock. And I'm going to pass by. And I'm going to just let you see my hinder parts. Just seeing the hinder parts of God, when Moses comes down from the mountain, there is so much glory on him, he has to cover his face because the people can't handle the glory that's on him. When was the last time people came in contact with you and said, I notice a glory on you. I notice an oil on your life. Every time you come around, my life starts changing. That's how we help the leader. That's how we hold up her arms. We take that responsibility off of the leader. Because the real assignment of the leader is to stay in the presence of God. But she can't stay in his presence if you always trying to be in her presence. And then you talking about she ain't got no word for my life. I can't get a word for your life. Because I got to deal with all your problems instead. But if you would be more responsible and do what you're supposed to do, I can posture myself to do what I'm supposed to do. If we're going to support leadership, make what they do easy because I, I, this, this book there's a lot of responsibilities we put on pastors that we have no bible for the bible says I shall give you pastors after my own heart that shall feed you with knowledge so you know what I discovered my real assignment is just to feed them that's it. That's it. Come on. I ain't got to come to all your family emergencies. Come on. Come on. That ain't my assignment. Yeah. I ain't coming to all them baby showers. Yeah. You done had three babies in three showers? Yeah. When I grew up, you gave hand me downs. You just, you got to have a shower for every one of them? Why we just don't have one big shot? We say, this one for all the ones you're going to have in the future. I'm not coming to all them birthday parties. That ain't my assignment. The assignment is to feed you. And the problem, why we can't really do our assignment, which is to feed you, it's because you don't show up at feeding time. Why well, we got to remind you about Bible study? By now, you know what time feeding time is. And you should just automatically show up. Why? Because my pastor is on assignment. And we are to feed you until you come to maturity. Here is real maturity. Real maturity is we are really supposed to work our way out of a job. That you become so mature, you no longer need a bottle, you got on meat, and now you are able to teach. You're able to impart what has been imparted to you. That's how you make the leader's job easy. But when we got to keep going over and over, oh, I'm closing with this. I'm a, I'm a principal of an elementary school in Miami, and the school I'm a principal of is an elementary school, but of the 500 students that are in that, in, in that school, 125 of them are what we call special needs or special ed. And so of those 125 each of the 125 have what is called an IEP, 
an individual educational plan. And so in our school district, students are in the general ed class. There are certain things you can do if they misbehave or whatever. You could send them home in the whole nine yards. But the kids who are in the special ed class, the same rules don't apply. Because it is understood some of the things they do is just a manifestation of their disability. So I understand with them Sometimes they keep on doing the same thing, expecting a different outcome. And when I was growing up, we would call it mental retardation. <laughs> and I discovered there are some saints keep doing the same old thing, expecting a different outcome. They must be on an IEP and suffering from mental retard. But, but here, here is what I stand. So in the school, we have classes for general ed students. And that's at large. But for our students who are special needs, we reduce the class size. Because we understand they can't function in a general population. And the truth of the matter is how God has structured the kingdom. Some of us, the reason why God couldn't put you in mega ministry is because you can't handle general population. He had to place you somewhere that could specialize with what you needed. It don't mean there's something wrong with you. It means you learn differently. And so he has placed you at a place where somebody can meet your individual needs. So that when you get out of here, you're able to function in the general population. So you see, and I don't say that as a principal, my, my youngest son, my youngest son has an IEP. He's, he's special needs. So elementary, he's special needs. Middle school, he was special needs. And this year he started high school. And started high school, he said, Daddy, I'm in high school now. First of all, don't tell nobody I had special needs. Because I'm ready to operate in the general population. That's the same thing God has done for you. He's given you a pastor to target the place you need so that when she is done ministering to those places, you're going to be able to function at your highest potential. <laughs>